Hello, everyone joining. Welcome to Hope Sparks, inspiring conversations that zero in on the evolving family and education innovation. I'm Hope, mama of two, change agent, Hope Spark, and education innovation specialist. Today, I'm pumped to introduce our guest. He's someone I just met, but I feel like I've known him for a lifetime. Models, building a school in Michigan called Upland Hills and playing the infinite game. He's written a book that I think changed my life. The Future of Education is where he shares an inspiring story of cultivating a new paradigm of love-based education, giving all children the opportunity to own their gifts and to develop an insatiable thirst for learning. I admit, I admit, I cried a few times when I read this book. Just knowing that teachers like Phil exist and schools like Upland Hills exist changed the way I look at education. I'll welcome Phil in in a second, but before I do, I'm going to don my most childlike energy, bringing it into the conversation that he's inspired. And I would love for you to share your questions, your comments during or after. I'll respond and share with Phil. Let's make this the opening of a larger conversation. Great to see you. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for creating this magic. Well, magic that was inspired, as we were just talking about me watching, following little breadcrumb trails of kind of an unfolding, as you would say, a mystery. A mystery that I was inspired by reading the book and I just felt like, you know what? When can one contact the author and see if we can see where this goes? So today is part of where this is going. And I would love for you to begin by sharing with me in the presence of whoever's watching, if it's parents, teachers, maybe children. I would love for you to share what is the infinite game and how has the concept of, an, of playing the infinite game inspired you with your work with children, with your work with building community and really informing what is a love-based education? Well, the infinite game, which I, I know now I've been playing for half of a century. <laughs> It's a long time to play the game. Yeah. <laughs> and I have no uh, intention of stopping playing the game because it, it, there is no end to the infinite game. It was first presented to me by my adopted grandfather, uh, the um, amazing inventor and poet and futurist and visionary, Buckminster Fuller. And Bucky invited us all to play something called World Game. And World Game had a premise to make the world work for 100% of humanity without disadvantaging the natural world. So that was the premise of World Game. And it was conceived in the midst of the Cold War and the number of nuclear arms that both sides had amassed on the planet. And it was in this alarming sense of how can you have that many bombs, nuclear weapons, and continue to play war games, shouldn't we shift the paradigm and start playing another game? How mm. about world game? Let's make the world work. And it was Bucky's, um, uh, it, was, it was Bucky's life experience that led him to believe that we have all the resources to feed everybody on the planet and to make the world work for 100% of humanity. Uh, one of the problems was we have all these blood clots, which is what he called nations and nation states. He saw this beautiful blue planet from space as our astronauts took those first pictures. And he, and he felt like we, our entire generation, when we first saw those pictures, whoa, there's no boundaries. There are no borders you know it's just this beautiful blue marble 
spinning and zipping in space. And that. it's a uh, transcendent experience. Still for me now, just thinking about it, I can feel that, uh, that sense of wonder and awe. So Bucky was, was saying, if we play world game, we're putting our attention in the right place because we're, we're attempting- Bringing to, it, bringing it up, like the perspective much larger. Yes, right. to make the world work for all of humanity. So we can sense into all the struggles that we're experiencing in this moment. And we can see how much scarcity is at, is at the very uh, source of all of this conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And if everybody had all that they needed to eat and to be safe and to be in a shelter and to connect with other people, and it was never our intent in playing world game to do anything other than celebrate all the different cultures. So because it was a, a more global way of thinking about the earth and about playing a game, it was always about the uniqueness of all the different places on the planet and the uniqueness of all the different cultures. And of course, all of the species on the planet and the mm. living Gaia quality of the planet, because for some of us looking at that picture, we could see that the earth was a whole organism. I mean, we didn't have the science necessarily to say that it was aware as we are finding out about our forests, that our mm -hmm. forests are not just a collection of trees, but through the mycelium and their connection and the long lives that some of them get to live over a hundred mm -hmm. years or 500 years in some places much longer than that, that the forests are aware, they're aware beings. And we, we thought of them as just objects, you know, oh, these trees. And we tried to plant forests and we planted all pine trees that would grow at the same time and they weren't forests, you know. So it was a uh, playing world game for me that was the summer of 1970 that mm -hmm. I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And um, the big irony was that I couldn't wait to get out of school. And then I immediately get called to do this to thing, the world <laughs> game. And, and I collect with a group of about 38 people. And we're all there for the same reason. We want to play an infinite game. We want to play world game. And we did for six weeks. Lots of confusion and lots of stumbling. I was given the access to Buckminster Fuller's office. So he was traveling. He was His on literal physical office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he was traveling. He was on a ship with Doxiatis and the futurists in some beautiful Greek ocean, you know, and, and, and I had his office, meaning I had access to this vault. And in the vault, there were all of the recordings of all of his lectures and there's his drawings and all of these things there. And they just gave me the key <laughs> and said, if you need a space to work on, I had a specific task to work on shelter. And if you need to access anything from Bucky's archive, why don't you just take this key and and it happened to be air conditioned, the office, and it was Carbondale and it was the summer and it could be 95 degrees and humid outside. So I was in that office every day, pretty much of the world. Feeling Bucky's energy, Felt feeling yeah. the infinite game descend on you, percolate yeah. through yeah, your young, through young self. Yeah, it was amazing, it was amazing. So let me just, for, yeah. for our viewers, just say a few things about the infinite game. Infinite game players play with rules, not by them. Mm -hmm. So it's always about paradigm shifting. The reason you play the game is to grow. There are no winners and losers in the infinite game. We're all conditioned and wired for finite games. We need referees on a field, a very clear set of instructions. And when you break those, we need somebody on that basketball court to blow their whistle and say, you cannot do this. This is gonna happen to the other team. Finite games are fine, but if you play only finite games, you end up with a world that's poisoned mm -hmm. and it's in great need of repair. Mm -hmm. So you, grow, you play to grow, you play to learn how to cooperate and collaborate, and you play because of the great mystery. You believe in something much greater than yourself. 
You know, Bucky had different ways of talking about what he would call met metaphysics, you know, and and it was through his stories and actually the way he would tune in. He never pre prepared for a... What is this? Tell everyone, because you told me what it is, and I haven't forgotten it. What yeah, it so this is what Bucky would do. He would stand in front of an audience, and he would go like this, and this was him tuning in to the frequency in the room. So he was leaning in to a new dimension, and the dimension was all of the people who had gathered. And mm -hmm. then when after he did this for a while, he would begin to speak. And he, mm -hmm. because he had no notes, and because every time he spoke, it was different, and it didn't matter what the hosting organization was, it could, could have been the uh, gathering of the global psychologists, or it could have been the engineers or architects, or it could have been... Indira Gandhi and and uh, and the entire uh, scientific community of India. It didn't matter where he was. He was tuning into that frequency, and then what he called thinking out loud. Mm. And so that kind of thing, you know, being in 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 his office was really an opportunity for me to soak in the dimensions there. And because there was a secret closet, I mean, it wasn't really secret, there was a vault, but the vault was open, you know? So I could right. go into the vault at any time and I could take out a cassette tape of a recording that he gave and then, and then I could listen to it. And I did that more than I did the research that I was intending to do for my right. group, you know, I was doing that. So um, the other thing that infinite gamers are, are looking to do is to leave the world better than mm. they found it. And there, that we call the legacy. The legacy piece, I believe, should be you disappear into the legacy. In other words, Buckminster Fuller is no longer here as, as a living human being. And I'm telling a little bit of his story, but not so that you know all of the things that happened in his life and what he accomplished. That's the individual achiever. Yeah. I want you to be under the spell of this amazing human being that some called the Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century. And I want you to explore the work, the depth and the meaning of, of that life. And I want him to disappear in the legacy. I want it to mm. become inside you like it is in me. So the experiment you know, that I and others gathered to do was to transform education. And that was something that Bucky was really insistent upon. And it was the reason that he traveled when he was 84 years old to be at Upland Hills School is, mm -hmm. is, is it was because of the children. You know, it was always- He loved children, didn't he? Oh my God, he was just, uh, he tell was me, wired, tell me how much wired he, for children. Yeah. Well, an example of how much he loved children occurred that night that he came to, to open the Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center. We had attempted to build a building that was a, what we would call a net energy building today. It was built out of on-site materials, that it was built in part by a wind generator that we had erected, that it was solar and that it was in Michigan and that it had roof overhangs that were perfectly calculated for the solar azimuth so the sun would penetrate deeply into the rock wall in February and be shaded in, uh, in July. So he came because of the children and the technology, you know, mm. and he saw that initiative as being so important that he added on to his already overcrowded schedule, speaking schedule, that he would speak in the afternoon at a major university about a half an hour away from where the school is. And then as soon as he was done with that, you know, I would pick him up and then take him out to uh, Upland Hills. And then he would open the Ecological Awareness Center. And the end of that evening, he had his arms around two kids who were there. Two kids mm -hmm. who were about in the seventh grade or eighth grade, you know. Mm -hmm. And while we were having dinner, there was one child sitting in between um, my father, you know, her grandfather and Bucky. And Bucky and Harry, that was my dad's, my dad's name, mm -hmm. were, were trying to get Sasha's attention throughout the entire meal. They were playing mm -hmm. little games. They were doing things with their hands. Bucky was folding his napkin, you know, and, and instead of Sasha being left out, 
all these adults right. around a dinner table. Which she happens. was the one they were paying all of the attention to. And she was so delighted that after she was uh, done with dinner, she was very excited and, and, and she said, uh, she got up and she started dancing and performing, sliding on the wood floor, you know, and, uh, and then Bucky was looking and he, he was raised in the East Coast. He had impeccable manners. So he, he said, can, can I be excused? And nobody had ever asked that. <laughs> and he was looking at me. So I said, sure. And he said, well, Bucky's a shakala. My dad had used a word to describe that excitement that Sasha had in her. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a Jewish word. Oh, I, I someone who, who shakes with joy. And oh, Bucky didn't know that. what that word meant. So he asked my dad, what does that mean? Right. And my dad said, someone who shakes with joy. And so Bucky got up and said, well, Bucky's a, ch a shakala too. And then he danced. Oh my gosh, such a profound energy comes from you when you talk about Bucky. From the moment we first started talking about Bucky, from in the book, The Future of Children that you wrote, he's like a throbbing thread all the way through. And I would love for you to share how Bucky, playing the infinite game and that expansion early in your life, led you to building a school. Like, what was it? that you used day to day in thinking about playing the infinite game and thinking about Bucky's influence when you were building out this school? Well, um, there are several things that Bucky taught that were, uh, that were repeated often. Mm -hmm. And one was that every child is born a genius and yes. the genius by unfavorable circumstances. And you could see that what he was pointing at is that schools were not places mm -hmm. where your imagination could run wild and where your throbbing spirit could be seen. Mm -hmm. So when he said, every child is born a genius, I just fell like hook, line, and sinker. And then I said, is that really true? Is every child born a genius? So I wanted to test that. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to test that idea. The other thing is I hungered for a grandfather um, my, uh, I didn't have a grandfather, you know, who I knew, mm -hmm. um, my grandfather who I knew a little bit died when I was about four years old. So I didn't have much of any kind of memory about, but I was always attracted to older men and, and always wanted to, and women as well. And I always wanted wisdom, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, I, I adopted, as many did, uh, Bucky as a grandfather, and he had this, he had this wisdom that he de departed, uh, imparted uh, uh, to us, and it was something like, take a, a design science resource inventory of all of your special case experiences, or, you know, a way of really saying that what has happened to you, you know, in your case, mm. all the traveling that you did with your family and the different places that you went to. In my case, being raised in a, a, a suburb of Detroit in mm. the most idyllic time to be a child, you know, as a part of the baby boom and a time when all of the economy and the war was over and, you know, everything was just flourishing and we were so safe, you know. So take a design science resource inventory of all the special case experiences things that are unique to you. Mm -hmm. What was unique to me was I was aware when I was in second grade that schools were rigged against certain kinds of intelligence. Right. Now, of course, I didn't think that thought, but what I thought was you shouldn't be making fun of Douglas Baker's stutter, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Hart. You should not be allowed to do that. You know, so I knew that there was something going on at school. That Intuitively, was you knew. Yeah. Which points to kids intuitively back to Bucky's quote or his thought of we are born geniuses. Yes. And we're born aware. Yes. Yeah. And and then when you see something that needs doing mm -hmm. that no one's tending to, do it and the living will come. Stop trying to make money. Instead, mm -hmm. make sense. That's mm -hmm. exactly how he put it. And when you do that, 
the living will come. And when someone else comes along and does it better than you do, get out of the way. So it was grandfatherly advice. And I wanted to test those, those things, those two things. One, every child is a genius. And my question yeah. was, is that really true? Is every Are child a genius? And right. the other one was, you know, try to create something, you know, to, in order to change an existing paradigm, the school that I was raised in, in uh, a factory town, you know, the center of factories in, in, in the industrial rev revolution for the United States was Detroit. And so mm -hmm. that school was very much like that. There was a clock and you moved when the clock told you the bells rang. Still you were going to be told what like to that. do. Like you're right. supposed to do the empty vessel and suck it in, you know. So in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle to try to change the problematic model. That was Bucky. Mm -hmm. Instead, you create a new model and you make the old one obsolete. So and your new model was love-based too. That's right. And I have to say, Phil, when I've shared with other people, Phil Moore, who who built and consciously nurtured a love-based school, they're like, what? What's a love-based school? <laughs> and the same way as when I say, he's playing the infinite game, explain to us what a love-based school looks like and feels like. I can imagine, but... Well, I'm going to share some secrets of it. <laughs> Just some secrets. We have a, a, a short time together. Um, imagine waking up every morning and going to work with your best friends. Think of all of the people that you love being with from childhood. And then if you have a good age range, it's better. You know, you might have a best friend. I have a best friend here who's three years old. And I have a best friend hid here who's 93, you know. So think of what it would be like to wake up in the morning and to go to work together with a team of people that you consider your best friends. Not just good friends, your yes. best friends. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. You're there. So you're kind of like on this extended, you know, sleepover thing. And right. you're doing it. But your work is to love each child into being, which means you have to tune in just the way that Bucky would tune in to mm -hmm. every child's individual genius. And there's mm -hmm. sometimes there most often is there's a, a there's a multiple set in there. It's not just one each child, genius. a multiple set of geniuses, right? Yeah, that's right. So you have to tune in. Now the child, in order to do a love-based school, you have to be a really good tuner. You know, like piano tuners when they come mm -hmm. to your homes and they want to tune your piano. They, 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 they get their equipment out. They know exactly what to do. And they begin to go through the process to try and figure out where that buzz came from right. and how to get the piano all in tune. And it doesn't really sound great until it's all in tune. I love so that you have metaphor. To okay. Tune yes. into every child. Yeah. Only you don't have one person tuning into every child. I'm just going to pick a, a, a point in time, but let's say in the 90s, you know, mm -hmm. you would have eight who were all doing the same thing. Eight people who had devoted themselves to this work, mm -hmm. who were living their dream job, you know, right. and were willing to take less money because of it. They mm -hmm. knew that they were being given, we were being given the opportunity to be social artists. And oh. to be social artists, it meant that we were not going to have the same pension plans as our, mm -hmm. uh, as our friends in, in traditional education were going to have. We weren't going to get the same salaries and benefits. We weren't going to be unionized. There were a bunch of things that, you know, we're not going to be yeah. the same. The trade-offs. I talk but, about the trade-offs. Yeah. There's always. But the yeah. main thing was we were doing what we loved in the place that we loved with the people that we loved. And that just okay. felt like, Oh man, that's a great move in the infinite game. Mm. If you can do all of those things. And that's what um what it was like to to co-create. There was never really the kind of leadership that's required when you're playing the infinite game is not a top-down model. It has to do with building, you know, a very coherent and very deep bonded group. Once that happens, you're much more of an organism 
than you are an individual, but you're an organism that respects each individual cell. You know, right. Or Actually, organ. you know what? If you don't mind me interrupting, uh, I have been chatting with a team of amazing educators building out a school, and they were struck by the idea of building community bonds by the idea of a bond being a foundation. And this looks like interpersonal bonds. This looks like bonds with teachers, bonds with parents, bonds with the nature around you, and just all connected. Uh, it, it really struck them as like a deep foundational element of building a new school. And it speaks to what, what, you're, what you're sharing right now. Do you have any words around community bonds or how you how you cultivated these bonds in your school well i mean you you were saying it beautifully reality is undivided wholeness mm -hmm. so if you're coming from that place that's what's real what's real isn't all the parts elementary education right. we're going to teach things broken down into their parts and biology will have nothing to do with poetry when, and in, in this model, in this paradigm, whoa, biology has everything to do with poetry. So reality is undivided wholeness, and everything is always in a state of emergence. And that's what teaching and being with children is about. Everything is always in this state of emergence. So the bonds that you form really are, are just like the bonds that we know about when, when chemicals come together. And when mm -hmm. you do something, you know, Bucky would talk about chrome, nickel, steel, and he would talk about the, ten the, the tensile strength of each of these things separately, but together there was an exponential tensile strength and it mm -hmm. was lighter. So whether it's titanium or any other kinds of metals, Bucky was so brilliant in so many different ways. And he would, engineering and chemistry were two of those ways, but you, you have these examples of synergy that are just astounding. And so that's what happens with us humans. So you yeah. take eight unique individuals who are doing what they love to do in the place that they want to be, you know, and they are being kind and they're living their, their life as a social artist. When that happens, a certain synergy occurs over time. It doesn't occur instantly. What can happen instantly is fall in love. Mm. That can happen instantly because that's not something you do. That's something that happens. But then you'll be tested. You mm -hmm. know, the world will test you. You don't have to create really difficult rites of passage. They will occur. In our case, mm. a bus accident in the end of the first decade. And right. a child's dead and three other are seriously injured, you know. So on that day, I know part of what was in my consciousness was your childhood is over. You know, this is what you've taken on. You're right. responsible in some way for what's happening here, not for the accident itself, but whether you fold at this moment or whether you stay together and grow stronger. This is your test. I know yeah. those are the moments I cried. I have to say, uh, reading your book, there were so many stories woven into your experience, sharing Upland Hills, your relationships, your learning. And one of the things that really struck me that I wanted to share and ask you is so often we as grown-ups with childlike qualities, but still grown-ups, we're concerned and focused on what we can teach children, what we can impart on children. And what I got from reading your book was a reminder for as a parent, as an, as an educator, um, is we're learning from children if we're open to it. And you, through the examples with real life stories and real heart, you shared so many real um, inspirations of how children taught you for decades and taught the people around you. I wonder if there's a, a little story you could share about a moment a child taught you something that you carried with you. I'm sure they did all day long, every day, but I was wondering if there was um, something you wanted to share. You know, there's a there's a uh, former student in my life right now who has um, is an entrepreneur, 
very, very successful. Um, and his parents are close to um, their final act, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has the means to travel anywhere in the world that he would like to and, and to be generous and, uh, and deeply connected to his community. But for whatever reasons, he, um, he wants me to be in, in, in his life, especially now. And he's yeah. fearing the death of his, of, of his parents. And, and he's also wanting to make amends. There's some reconciliation work he wants to do because he put them mm -hmm. through some very trying times. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just gonna say something about that because it's fresh and it's in my mind and he was here last week with them, you know. Amazing. So, so it, it, it's so recent that I, I can just say that, the, and I taught him when I was teaching the oldest group, which is the seventh and eighth graders, for some people we would call that middle school. We realized mm -hmm. as a group that if those kids were really engaged and excited and happy and caring, then the whole school worked, you know. So we couldn't explain why that was true, but if they were in great shape, the school was in great shape. So I was teaching that group at this time, and he was in that, he was in that morning meeting. Well, hanging out with him, his name is Joe, hanging out with Joe, with his parents, and seeing all the, the plates he's trying to spin at any given moment because he's just as choleric temperament as he was when he was a child. He's kind of, he's like Tigger in Winnie the Pooh. He's got to be <laughs> moving around doing all, yeah. the, all the time. And, I, and when I'm with him, you know, there's, there's the times he'll just come through from his heart and he'll say, you know, you taught me super learning. And I super think, learning. Yeah, I said, wow, you remember that? He said, yeah. And then he starts speaking Italian to me, you know, Io sono pescatore, you know, he, he, he's, he's telling me this stuff. And then he sings a, a Thai song to me, you know. And then he says, this is why what I learned from super learning. This is why I'm able to do some of these things. Are they teaching it now? And so just in that short little thing that happens at dinner at some moment, mm -hmm. I realize, one, just how powerful our influence can be on another mm -hmm. human being. A memory that is not really fresh in my mind. He's he's now explaining to me, learning how to do breathing and listening to Mozart, and then learning a foreign language, which is what super learning was about. You know, he's showing me he's been using it as a tool in mm. his life in order to navigate, and then he's connecting it to um, wanting to reconcile with his parents. And he's asking advice all in the same moment. So in one short little interaction that we have at, at dinner, he's like on four different dimensions. All four of those dimensions I unpack later on that evening, you know. And mm. I just am so touched by everything that he's wanting to reconcile, wanting his parents to know how much he loves them and how mm. he put them through hell and he's saying he's sorry they don't think that at all, by the way, at this point. They don't have that in them at all. But he, he, needs, he, he, needs, it. he needs that reconciliation. He wants me to know that I was a really good teacher for him. He wants me to know that these things are still tools that he's using it. And he connects it to the Thai teacher, whose name was Oot, who taught us that song. And he wants to pay for me and him to fly to Thailand to find Oot <laughs> and to thank him for being a part of our lives. Wow. You know, listening to you say that helps me understand a really uh, important theme that kept coming up over and over again. And actually since meeting you, it's profoundly been on my mind and it's listening on so many different levels. You sharing about your interaction with Joe, and in that split second when he's doing all of these things and sharing, you can tell you're listening in on all the things that his self, his heart, his memories, all these things are going on at once. Uh, I just love the section in your book around 
learning how to listen. And I think that's something if we're talking about education and where we are in the world at the moment, and I would say one of my missions is to really put my head to the ground or to really get my heart involved and listen to sometimes what's not being said. Yes. And I, I think educators, innovators, entrepreneurs, teachers, when we're talking about the future of children, coming back to something as base as how do we listen is so important. It's actually the key. Yeah. You know, with, without that tuning in, without that, you, you really don't have anything other than a superficial interaction. Yeah. But when you can do that kind of listening, and, and Bucky wore these big ear, hearing aids, you know, um, mm -hmm. and if he didn't understand something, he always, you know, asked for an explanation. Define it. <laughs> Shukla. Spell it. Shukla. <laughs> then, and then he had to embody it. He had to get up and demonstrate his joy that was moving through his body in that mm. moment. You know, so mm. that comes from a, a depth in, you know, there's, there's a, a model that I often think of as a, a tetrahedron that has to do with um, kind of a, why we seek, why we, why people become mystics or spiritual, you know, and one, the first thing is depth. We, we mm -hmm. crave greater depth. The second thing is uh, discipline that we're not going to be easily dissuade. You mm -hmm. know, you know, you, you have a discipline around connecting people and mm -hmm. informing people about new paradigm ways of being with their kids. You know? mm -hmm. The third is surrender. There's a point at which you let go and it's in the letting go that, you know, it's in the vacancy of, of anything. And listening can be a surrender. You know, you, you can surrender completely so that you're not listening from over here. You're listening from over there. So with a, a little baby or a little boy, my friend Augie, who's three, you know, mm. if he senses that I'm listening from inside him, something powerful comes out because he's not sensing my agenda. Augie, get to the point. You know, I didn't understand that word. Say it again. You know, if I'm mm. doing that kind of thing, that's different. But if I'm listening from inside of Augie, mm. I'm no longer Phil. He feels that. That's a form of love. You mm -hmm. ask what a love-based education is? Listening is a form, paying attention is a form of love. One of the most powerful forms of love is, is listening, is paying attention. And you know, the, the last one is service, is because once you've done those, you go through the depth and the discipline and the surrender, there's service. You just like this broadcast. Mm -hmm you know, on Facebook is exactly, you could see the whole tetrahedron in it, right? You, you want to share it with others. Yeah. I want to, sh I want to listen and I want to share with people who feel like they understand, they have a finite perhaps view of where education is going and, and maybe they know a lot. And for parents who are struggling with where is learning and education or opportunities for my children going, the future is kind of wild and uncertain right now. And I think that there is a lot of hope, a lot of love, a lot of fantastic learnings from you, the legacy of Bucky, from already what's happened and some that's happening right here, right now, new things happening. I think there is something about following your nose and following the mystery of unfolding it, letting it emerge, connecting people and seeing what, what happens. I think it's, yeah, it's profound. And that's what synergy means, you know? And mm -hmm. so that was one of the things that Bucky would do is he would ask the audience, how many of you know what synergy means by a show of hands? It was so important because we had been trained to divide and conquer in education. 
and yeah. to fraction you know to fractionate everything if we have a cell what happens if we divide it if we have an atom what happens when we smash it can we see it with our senses how big are the microscopes do we need in order to see these subatomic particles is it possible you know all of that is all about fractionating you know mm -hmm. the uh, the opposite end of that is this wholeness everything is wholeness so already we, yeah it's all whole and it's all complete in every moment you know so when you have that kind of listening and when you have that kind of um ability to disappear into that listening you create possibilities infinite possibilities that's why you're playing the infinite game there is a, a film called infinite possibilities um and it's about david i'll share Bowen. it in the i'll share it in the link and i think that that would be you know so if, if people are interested in kind of the physics and the mystical part of the physics and that would be a great film to see and for the potential but it it was in the testing of all those things that we discovered um, all the things that you couldn't possibly discover, the most important one being that in the, the, the territory of what you don't know, you don't know. Mm. Your best preparation is to be able to trust something that is yet to emerge and is about to emerge. And you do that collectively. In other words, you, you, you need more than one to right. really do that. So you have to understand how to create these bonds and of course, and trust within the bonds. That that's that's really essential. Which means mm. you have to know what it what it is to to go through betrayal. Joey's story has in it his awareness of how mm. close he came to really really screwing up. Everything, okay. You know, so it has that in it. You know, mm. so that it, when we say trust and we say bonds, we can feel okay. Yeah, that's easy to do. But no, there's lots of pain and suffering that goes on in friendships. If yes. we break every friendship that we have because of it, when there's no death. But if we are wounded and then we figure out, oh, this is a piece that I have not cleaned up in me. Mm. And in order for me to reconnect in that friendship, can we do this in a more, that bonds us deeper? Can I be that vulnerable to say to Jack, you know, I know we don't have words for what happened, but I just want you to know, I realize what I, I did to help cause mm -hmm. that fraction, that fractionating of our relationship. And I, I still love you. Yeah. I, lo I love that. I, I think being at one stage in our life and being able to trace back certain things that are still living in us, whether it's a bond that was broken or an experience that affected us or impacted us. I'm watching that working with entrepreneurs and people in, in the grown up world. They're hanging on to things or often really sort of washing around in things that happened when they were children. And sometimes often when they were in education. And what I see as an opportunity, always when I'm speaking to grown ups is to go back and repair some of that that's happened when they're younger, but also think, how can we create love-based, trusting, bond-filled environments for children now? So that when they're grown-ups, I, I love that quote about, um, I think it was Jean who mentioned her childhood was intact and she brings it with her all the time. And that's, she's able to bring it out to comfort her, to find her compass, and that's really also what inspired me about your book um, is really understanding that creating that intact start to life with love, with trust, with bonds, with nature, with community carries through as like the greatest payoff that just keeps going and going and going. I mean, you and I are not exactly the same age. Maybe we are on the inside, our child, child being, but you strike me as an intact child who is beaming that intact energy out to others so that is really a hope i have for people who are working with children now you know there's this thing that um i think ken wilbur said at some point that we have to clean up 
that has to do with the work that we have to do internally. Mm. You know, we have to show up. And that, that means that even though this day I don't feel like going in, you know, I've got to show up for this relationship. We have to grow up. And that means that we know the difference between being childish and being childlike, you know, and then we have to wake up. So you can see that in those four ups, we, we, there's work that needs to be done for Jack and I to heal our relationship. I needed to do all of those things. Mm. I needed to clean up stuff that was in here, you know, that it was overly sensitive to a, a situation. I have to need, I have to discover what some of our friends did in the mystery school recently and do some alchemy on those things and realize, oh, I didn't have a friend to play with, but I had this natural world to play with. And I learned how to play and learn and grow and be nourished by the natural world. I always thought my childhood was lonely and now I see it was magical. Well, that's alchemy. You my can father only... said the same thing. He said, I'm completely re-envisioning how my childhood was now with a new perspective and it's filling me with joy and contentment and peace. And to know that, I'm in my 40s, to know that I have that to look forward to with that work of ups. Um, I love that, Phil, that's amazing. Uh, I, I wonder as we're, we're coming, you know, nearing to spending time together, I wonder if you have some words for teachers, people who are working, building schools, building models, there's a lot of talk about what kids need to learn and how we need to do things for them in this evolution of education. What would you remind them or suggest or offer as some wisdom? Just fill more sharing. Well, it, you know, it depends on how it's received, whether it's really wisdom or not. But one of the things that we struggle with is a content and context. And for some reason, we're so hardwired in this content piece, we forget about context. And what I discovered and what we discovered together collectively and what I know now as a grandparent is that um, if your imagination is alive and your passion is engaged, you will learn mm. everything and anything you want to learn. But if I try to if I try to guess and predict the future of where you're going to make the biggest influence on behalf of all of humanity, and then I say, well, he, you know, come into the room with metaphorically 5,000 books and say, you've got to read every one of these books, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like the stupidest thing in the world. And I think we, as, as parents, sometimes we don't really realize that we're so stuck on content mm. and what is the curriculum if the curriculum is imagination if the curriculum is fall in love with the natural world if the curriculum is make really good friends well you're in good shape if For the life. curriculum is got to be yeah. a students in all of these areas and they're only a valedictorian if they get a student uh, they're an a student in every single area that's mm. a game that is rigged against humanity not just the individual, but all of us lose in that game because some of us aren't great in mathematics. Okay. Some of us are amazing in music. That okay. unique genius. You know? We all have our genius. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I would say that thing about context and content and testing uh, may have its place in certain situations, but mm -hmm. for the most part is a way to have a metric you know, a number attached to you as an individual achiever, I think it's a recipe for disaster. So mm -hmm. for the most part, I don't have any really great affection for- That's uh, a good way of putting it. <laughs> the Mist Measure of Man by Stephen Gould, Stephen J. Gould is a great book to read if you're interested in the IQ test and how it was developed and why it's a mismeasure of man. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, so I would say those things, you know, I'm thinking about how to create a program. I'm more than thinking about it. I'm designing with a team, a new team to, to activate the, some of the content of the book and to have these 90 minute sessions, you know, maybe 
90 minutes to 120 minutes, you know, these eight activations sessions. And it's really because Bucky was always about direct experience. Mm. You know? So I know that you and your family have traveled to Bali and I know you've gone to the Bali school there. They, they were a part of that community. That experience is what I would call wild school. There's mm -hmm. nothing better for children and for, for bonding as a family than something like that. That's just such a perfect way to do it. And, uh, and to activate the content of the book, I've come up with um, these names and, uh, and part of my team came up with the names. I would say something and, uh, and, they, and I had the book you know, chapter headings and, and then they said, uh, well, how about we call the first one sacred bubble protection? And so that was a really neat thing. Now huh. you have, oh, this is what you need, you know, just like the womb. You need to have in the early years that. The cocoon of creativity was number two. Well, okay. that's also a really great one. Because if you get kids excited about being in a play or about, you know, poetry or about yeah. creating sculptures or about building forts or whatever it is. Rockets, launching. Really, that's it. <laughs> then the, the third one was infinite design and exploration. That's the third module. And so that's when we really go into why design science is so important and why exploration is important. And then there's intelligence amplifier, understanding and expanding our ideas of what intelligence means. So those are some of the modules that we're working with in order to bring it into uh, full activation. And you, the only way you can do that really is by doing it and by testing it. Right. So, so 50 schools years. Can be like, I think you put, um, what was it there? An ex, uh, a lab for evolutionary, like making schools, these evolutionary labs and to consider them like that. I love that. It was like, think, get it into the mindset that you're testing and tweaking and failing forward and learning from those failures. And exactly. I will, uh, I will be pulsing out as I do at the Hopi Beacon of when you have your activation online that people, schools, will parents also be able to take part in this or is this? There's just no question in my mind, anyone who cares about children, anyone who loves children should be involved in something like this because it doesn't matter whether you're you know, in, in school yourself right now Mm -hmm. or whether you're 98 years old. Um, anyone who loves children will benefit from this because a lot of it feeds the sacred child within. And then we'll be doing work in dyads, a lot of work in dyads. So we'll be meeting, you know, let's say there were mm -hmm. uh, 400 people or there were 48 people, you know, a, a certain number of people who were doing the activation, the first activation, there would be opportunities for you to meet everybody in, in a smaller group. To but create those a, bonds. And, to create and those bonds. It's it has remarkable. to happen that way. And in, the, in a larger group, you will have an opportunity to, in let's say eight sessions, to have at least 16 meaningful interactions with other people. And that will... Uh, vibrate and, and raise the frequency of the whole group. The mystery about this whole work is, is that when you take on this initiative and the living will come, so you have to really mm -hmm. trust that the living will come. As uh, one of the people I'm consulting with right now, who's working in the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, is, is one of those people that you just know by being with her for, for a very short time, this person is really a strong human being who is a force to reckon with. And I just knew that about her. Oh my and goodness, I wanna meet this person too. Yeah. She is, she's manifesting and building those bonds and she's going to be able to do it because she believes, <coughs> she has the trust, mm. you know, to take a step into the unknown and to, and to believe that something will rise up and hold you at that moment when you take that step. For that moment, that was beautiful. Just say it again, that, that last one was, because I know there's one person in particular on the precipice of building something and feeling like they need to push themselves out to trust themselves to do this. But and what you just said was so beautiful, is to build it, 
and for to let it emerge, right? Yes. And to believe in it, because if it was you engineering this whole game, if, if you were being given the task, oh, I'm going to have to breathe all day in order for me to get through this day. <laughs> well, that job is taken care of for you. You do not have to do that. I'm going to beat my heart all day so that I can get through this day. Well, there's something beating, but it's not you beating it, you know. So in this work of collective uh, manifestation in terms of new kinds of schools or learning environments or learning communities, there's, there's this, 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 often you're, you're asked to take that step. And taking that step doesn't mean that you do it in a cavalier way. I mean, you just don't say, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump off the edge of this precipice and somehow I'm going to fly. It's not that. You have to really gather the consciousness, create the field, have the bonds in place. And then there is a time when it just seems to be doing it itself. You're not doing anything. It's doing you. And mm. what is the it? Well, maybe... It's the implicate order because that's what David Bohm calls it. And I really love that. That it's all in this coming from this empty plenum. It's not the stars that are important. It's the plenum that gave birth to the stars that's important. And it's all in the implicate order. Somehow the implicate order is unfolding in this way. And your job is to trust it and to take that step. And I can just say, well, I mean, I'm here being able to talk about it after the first year was 1971 and 1972. And it's uh, in really good hands and the community is unfolding, I'm sure, in ways that will surprise me and maybe even shock me when I return. I, I'm set to return in September of, you are? Okay. of this, this year. Um, and I don't, and, I, and, and I'm, it's, I'm gonna have to follow my own advice because a yeah. part of me is going, Really? Are you ready to take that step to return to the place where you were raised and, and loved into being yourself? And, there, and there's a part of me that says, oh, I don't, I don't know if I can do it. And then there's another part of me that says, yeah, you can do it. You need to do it. You need to do it. Yeah. I can't wait to hear. Phil, I love this. Thank you so much your energy, your smile. There's one word that I'm going to utter now and I'm going to do it. I'm going to try and do it like you do. You know what that word is, don't you? I think so. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who knows me well knows that I'm just captivated by words. And Wopila, as soon as you shared that with me, I was like, oh, that word is going to stay with me forever. Wopila, do you want to share it in the way that you you tell? In it? Lakota, this is a Lakota word that means uh, deep gratitude for all that has happened to create this moment that we're in, and for the possibilities inherent in every moment that goes forward. So it's so process oriented, as opposed to English being so uh, you know thing oriented. Wopila, Wopila, Wopila. is saying. Thank you, but it's saying thank you in such an amazing way for all of existence. That's the first part of it. Whoa, for all of existence. Whoa, Pila. And for the inherent possibilities and blessings in every instant to follow. Mm. And so it's a beautiful way to end. <laughs> oh, Phil, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I will be sharing and pulsing out my Hopi beacon. You know I will. And I can't wait to hear and see who connects with you as a result. Yeah, it was an honor. You. Hope you spark joy in such a beautiful way. It's a co-creative experience. Thank you.